Welcome back to the firm. Mandapuram Finance's investors are a lucky lot. Not all of them, only a select few that enjoy special rights. A long list of very special rights accorded to five investors, including private equity funds, who hold between them approximately 22% of Mannapuram. For instance, as long as AAIA and Hudson hold 1% of the company's share capital, they each hold the right to appoint one director on board. The same applies to Bearings and Sequoia. GHIOF is the luckiest. Even the ownership of a single share gives it the right to appoint a director on board Mannapuram. This seemingly disproportionate board representation could amount to board control as together they constitute five of the not more than 12 directors the board can have including a chairman with no casting vote except GHIOF each investor will have representation in each board committee that means pretty much the entire committee will constitute these investors directors and yes both AAIA and Hudson directors must be present to constitute the quorum of five in board meetings and general shareholders meetings. By the way, the two Bearings and Sequoia directors do not carry any liability. The company has promised to protect them against any charges or proceedings. Wait, there's more. Hudson and AAIA enjoy a long list of affirmative rights covering 24 items. That means for everything from marketing agreements to acquisitions, approval of annual business plan to capital structure changes, employment terms of key managerial personnel to related party transactions. Mannapuram needs the written consent or an affirmative vote of these two investors. The transfer of more than 3% shares by the promoters needs the prior written consent of AAIA and Hudson. They also have the right of first sale, of first offer and tag-along rights. Bearings and Sequoia have enforced a one-year lock-in on promoter shares starting 14th March this year. There's lots more, but I'll end by saying that if AAIA and Hudson choose to exit, the amended articles make it the company's obligation to facilitate that exit via a secondary offering or private placement. Now, some of these rights, those pertaining to AAIA or Hudson, for instance, have existed in the articles since 2008. This amendment seems to be extending these rights and adding more rights to the more recent investors. The question is, why are some investors more special than others? Are such differential rights allowed in a listed company? And do these special investors effectively control Mannapuram through their many affirmative rights? Siddharth Shah of Nishit Desai and Associate and Vivek Gupta of BMR join me to talk about this. Gentlemen, to both of you, a warm welcome. I'll start with you first, Siddharth. This matter came up when proxy advisory firm IIAS raised it and recommended that shareholders of Mannapuram vote against this amended Articles of Association because IIAS says in a listed entity giving one set of shareholders certain preferential rights is inimical to the interest of other investors. What do you make of the fact that is this within the letter of the law but not within the spirit of the law or is it against the letter of the law and against the spirit of the law? How do you see it? Uh, traditionally, it was not uncommon for the shareholders, even in case of a public company, to have exhaustive affirmative rights and what we call vetoes or negative control rights. Right. Uh, however, obviously, as the uh, as the law evolved, the regulatory mindset evolved. We have seen SEBI and especially the exchanges uh, growing more and more conservative and more, uh, I would say, uh, sensitive to the idea of special rights being created for certain set of shareholders. And that's something which we have been experiences every time you take a company public and uh, clear direction coming in from the exchanges to dilute or do away with a lot of shareholders right and that's been the position when it comes to a company which is going in for a pub, uh, for a listing if you're cleaning up this stuff when you're about to list then why shouldn't the same standard apply during the course of the listed life of a company I, I agree with the philosophy there and I think that's probably where ultimately the law would evolve in my view so I think the first thing we have to recognize is at this point in time the law does not enforce an explicit bar on on investors who hold these rights the way I look at these rights is, uh, legalistically, the way I look at these rights is that I divide them into three types of rights. One are the kinds of rights that relate to transferability of shares. So these are your rights relate, relating to tags, rofers, etc. 
I think the legal argument there could be around Section 111A of the Companies Act to say whether in a public listed company these rights can exist or they can't exist. Uh, if, if one were to look at the latest judgments on this, I think these rights are recognized by courts and courts say that uh, two independent parties can always transact in a way and can always agree transferability restrictions inter se themselves. In fact, an interesting nugget here is that the latest draft of the company's bill also seems to accord recognition to these inter-shareholder transfer rights. Uh, and has a specific proviso which allows recognition of these rights. So these are the first kind of rights. The second kind of rights are the affirmatives that you mentioned, uh, which are the negative control rights. Uh, there I, I would legally argue that your takeover code already uh, assumes a situation where a specific investor can have negative control rights. We've seen uh, litigation in the form of Shukam Ventures here. SEBI took a certain view, the tribunal took a certain view, and, and, and then the matter went up to courts and so on. So one would therefore legally argue that if the very fact that Takeover Code recognizes this itself means that these rights are per se allowed. Now, whether it impacts control under the takeover code or not is a separate issue. The only kind of rights where I think I have a legal problem is with the third category of rights, which are information rights. So I think in a public listed company, the basic assumption is that every transacting party, every member of the public, every non-promoter shareholder is roughly subjected to the same level of information. Uh, this is sought to be achieved through the insider trading regulations and so on. So information rights in the context of these regulations may get a little tricky, but the first two categories of rights, I think, uh, are rights that the law itself recognizes could be available to specific shareholders. Uh, so if I were to look at your question purely legally, I would, I would actually argue that there may be situations where these rights should exist, now, really? Vivek, is, let me separate... stop you there. Let me stop you there. In one place in this amended Articles of Association, it says that one investor, namely GHIOF, some Mauritius-based investor, has the right to appoint a director on board even if it holds one share. As long as it holds any shares, it has the right to appoint a director on board. I'm curious if that right was handed out to all retail investors, we'd all have directors on boards of companies. So I think that these rights allow for disproportionate representation on board, they allow for disproportionate representation in shareholder general meetings and essentially, we'll come to the issue of control, give this set of investors an unfair amount of large control over the operations of this company as opposed to regular other investors. How can you say that these rights pass master? No, so all I am saying is, so I'm, I'm not making the case that these rights pass master per se. In every situation, one has to see what kind of rights exist and whether they're fair in that situation or not. But who is to make that assessment of whether it's fair or not? I think in a company, th this judgment has to be made by the company's shareholders, including the promoter shareholders. Now, if I am a promoter of a company and I believe and I can convince my minority shareholders that having someone on board is useful for the company. Okay, Vivek, I'll, interrupt you, I'll interrupt you there. The reason why I'll interrupt you there is because I know several private equity people have made this argument before that at the end of the day, if you have some sort of minority interest being taken care of at the board level itself, that is beneficial to all minority investors. Mm -hmm. But that is based on the assumption that the interest of a fund or a private equity equity fund or some Mauritius based investor is equal to the invest interest of all minority investors. I'm not sure there will always be commonality in all of that. But I'll leave that aside. I want to come to the control bit before we run out of time. So that what do you make of the fact that there is I think almost in every instance, whether this company sneezes, coughs or brushes its teeth, mm -hmm. it needs the explicit permission of some investor or the other from within this group of five investors. And would that amount to control? This is very akin to the Shubkam case, isn't it? Yeah, no, that's true. And I think, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, unfortunately, the position of law never got settled with Shubkam. Yeah, because uh, it, the case got withdrawn at the that, Supreme Court level. That's right. Okay, if you purely ask me for the interpretation based on the definition of control and how SET has interpreted this. Clearly, it demonstrates that for an open offer to be triggered, it has to be something which is 
a positive control. So this would not amount to control based on what SAT has said in That's the Shubkam judgment. Vivek, would you recommend your clients include such a long, exhaustive laundry list of rights uh, in such shareholder agreements, uh, you know, based on how you view control and whether the SAT judgment prevails, or you think SEBI could take this matter further? See, SEBI should take a holistic view based on the facts and circumstances of, of each case. Uh, in this case, actually, the fact of the matter is that these rights have existed since 2008. Hmm. At this point in time, all that is sought to be done is to uh, extend these rights, extend part of these rights to two, to two additional investors who have right. come in, to, to the two, two new investors who have come in. So, I would, I would imagine that SEBI or the stock exchanges would have applied their minds already uh, in terms of seeing whether these rights constitute control or not. In so far as the law of the land today is concerned, given that the maximum authority that we have today is the SAT judgment and Shubkam ventures, it does seem that negative control of this kind does not constitute control. And that's what the law of the land today says. Uh, I go further to say that each case should be evaluated by SEBI to see whether in fact there are elements of control or not. I am not in the camp which says necessarily P's having additional rights is good or necessarily P's should not have these uh, special rights. All I say is that it should be left to the parties, maybe the promoters take a call and then the minority shareholders vote in a separate resolution to allow or disallow this amendment in the articles. I just wanted to also add one point out here. If you really look at the previous version of the takeover code hmm. and where the trigger of an uh, open offer was pursuant to a change in control. There was a specific carve out that if there was a change in control, but if that was approved by the shareholders through a special resolution, passed in a postal ballot, in those situations it would White not tend them out to a change that in control. That was a whitewash and that whitewash has been taken away in the new takeover now, code. At some level, if you, I, I know it, the new court does not provide for this provision and in, in some sense maybe that could change a perspective out here. But if you look at the philosophy there, the same principle that if a shareholder is approving certain change in control or certain rights being given to a shareholder, then to that extent a shareholder is supreme under the corporate jurisprudence. In its all wisdom, if they have approved certain rights, then to that extent why a change in control should trigger an open offer if the shareholders have accepted that. As Vivek said, if there is a mechanism where SEBI can direct that, okay, if these need to be approved, if it is approved by shareholders other than the interested shareholders, which is promoters in some sense, I think then a perspective could be a lot different. Okay, all right. So, so that's what essentially both Vivek and you are saying is it's up to shareholders. As a final question, uh, and not in terms of control, but in terms of whether this is fair or not, differential rights to one group of investors, do you think that SEBI or the exchanges would intervene? So the way I look at it, the process going forward can possibly open up an opportunity for an exchange essentially to look at it. SEBI, of course, as a securities regulator would always have a right to question, but in the process, when the shareholders approve these amendments to the article, to that extent, those amended articles would need to be filed with the exchanges. And in the past, we have seen exchanges at times can object to certain provisions of the article. Hmm. To what extent, because these provisions already existed since 2008, and nobody has and raised, nobody any has raised an now. objection, is one way to look at it, whether the exchange would just look at it as an extension of those And rights. to be fair, the most offensive ones have existed since 2008. That's the right. ones that are being introduced now by virtue of those two new investors That's are right. fairly standard ones. All they say is in these important matters, the matters will be approved by the board first, That's you right. know, before the company makes any decision, which in itself is not a bad thing. It doesn't accord Absolutely. special rights. Absolutely. So the new rights that are being tagged on are not as offensive as the existing rights and nobody raised any objection that to the existing may be Right. one way in which an exchange could look at it. The only other way possible, hmm. and we need to see how it really uh, unfolds, is because since 2009, they did not directly in respect of dealing with these issues, but shares with differential rights, rights or any yeah. manner in which shares issued, which create superior rights in favor of any person. 
if they extend the same philosophy hmm. and try to look at it whether it is in the compliance with the spirit of a listing agreement that may be one opportunity for an exchange to really examine these rights from the perspective of whether it creates differential uh, rights in favor of different set of shareholders all right i'll close by saying that the regulator and the exchanges have raised no objection regarding many of these rights that have existed since 2008 so it's now probably up to shareholders will this pass muster with them so that vivek thank you very much for joining me and thank you very much for watching Thank mm -hmm. you.